now I'm going to introduce our next presenter, Dr. Moon. She's our on oncology subspecial lead for GU cancer, as well as principal investigator for GU cancer and melanoma cancers. She has many titles. She wears many hats, including a wonderful mom. <laughs> Uh, one of her uh, title is a uh, part of Swag Melanoma Group. Her special interest is in the above uh, cancer types, melanoma, GU, cancer delivery, and research access within large care organizations. She's also interested in immune oncology trials and cellular therapy. She's one of the most determined person I've known. We are excited that she uh, continues to bring translational research to our patient care inside the Kaiser Permanente. And now I hand over the presentation to Dr. Moon. Hi, Sherry. Uh, thank you. Um, as a mother, my children are now set up on a video iPad for the next hour or so as an example of excellent maternal care. But I have uh, some slides to share. I had the privilege of working with Dr. Sue um, and Dr. Baldwin. And Dr. Neri is our fearless leader at Kaiser uh, in Riverside uh, for, for gosh, almost a decade. I think I'm on my 11th year. And we were all kind of privileging the, taking care of Dr. Lawrence. And what you guys may not know is that Dr. Lawrence, I believe, is the first patient in the United States to receive the commercial product of TVET when we were able to inject it locally. And um, that's kind of the level of uh, cutting edge care. And I actually remember it very well. Uh, TVEC approval came on a Thursday, I think right around Thanksgiving. And that Monday we were able to get drug into him. So um, it, it was it was a story, it was a, a clinical story that really touched all of us and, and you know, for me launched my uh, my leadership career and my research career. So without further ado, I do have slides to show, and it's going to look a little wonky for a bit, so bear with me. I have 39 slides, and I have 20 minutes, so um, it will be a fast presentation. And if you guys have any questions, please let me know. Um, first, can you guys see my slides? Can I get a Sam, Eric, little wink wink either way? Oh, you did great. Okay, all right. So. Um, I'm talking about immunotherapy and the treatment of cancer, and specifically I tailored this talk for in 2021. Some of it actually, uh, I think Sherry, you may have seen before, Scott have seen before, but uh, my name is Helen. I'm an oncologist by trade, trained at USC, and I specifically lead the GU program at Southern California Kaiser. My research interests originally start off with immunotherapy, and from that bubbled into both melanoma and the GU pipeline. And, you know, we see this actually a number of talks and it talks about the burden of cancer in our society to our patients, the, uh, the, the pain that is uh, treatment, surgery, radiation, and we talk about it as solutions, but they're not solutions without consequences, right? And the medications we give are also have side effects no matter how good they are. And this is something that really needs to be acknowledged I heard a stat that says something like one in two Americans throughout their lifetime will be touched by some version of cancer. And that is in some way a shocking, shocking statistic. Having said that, ever since about uh, 2000, cancer mortality has been falling. And that is through efforts with, uh, with physicians like Dr. Baldwin, who uh, has optimized and um, streamlined uh, surgical care, uh, Dr. Sue about uh, the target immunotherapy, chemotherapy, and also in the greater scheme about we can have as best care as possible, but it doesn't mean dilly squat if you can't access it, right? So all of those things go into a much more rosier pictures for our patients in the United States, but it does not mean that the burden is lessening. And this is an unevenly shared burden. We are the United States of America. There are uh, different regional um, specialties. And I, and I think that there is a comment from someone from New Jersey, you can find yourself on this map in California, which sometimes we think is kind of the only state, uh, a little bit obnoxious there, but um, it's just a very different burden on the West Coast and East Coast. And it's something that we acknowledge, um, sit on some NCI committees and we talk about how these resources should be, uh, should be split throughout the country. 
task and timeline of pioneering cancer specific treatment. You know, we think about cancer treatment and modern medicine as the end all and be all, but we forget that medicine actually has a really long uh, timeline, right? From the Socratic method all the way to really modern medicine as we know it as think about really comes from the two world wars, radiation, um, surgical skills were honed actually and advanced with uh, what at the beginning, World War I, World War II, anesthesia came from that time. And it wasn't really until the 1950s and 60s that chemotherapy first came around. And so if you think of modern medicine, it really is a 60-year phenomenon, and we are still pushing this forward. A um, couple of different things to, to think about. Um, I used to think of uh, cancer care as a tripod. You cut it out, you burn it out, or you poison it out. And here we have the cytotoxic chemotherapy. And uh, but nowadays, I'm actually not sure if the video is over. But nowadays, it's actually a lot more complicated. Now I think of it really as a five-legged situation, and I'm sure it's even growing uh, as we speak. But the idea of targeted therapy, so the idea of a lock and key, right? As we understand cancer better, as we understand molecular changes. Uh, genetic um, alterations, is there certain driving mutations that if we have the key, we need the medication and we can somehow undo that, it has altered survival for a variety of cancers. The most famous and notable example being CML, which is a disease that used to have about a six to 10 year lifespan, and we return them to a normal lifespan, albeit with chronic medication intake. And so here we're talking a little bit about immunotherapy, right? What are the unique challenges in treatment and assessment of patients in that stance? You're going to see some of these slides uh, in Dr. Sue's talk, but I'll talk a little bit about the general concept. If you think of cancer, which is a cell that lives forever and likes to go places, the question is, is this really an irreversible process? Because one of the very interesting things is that spontaneous regression of tumors have been reported for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Now, remember some of it, these are not um, scientifically vetted process. They almost uh, take on- uh, Dr. Moon, sorry, uh -huh. sorry to interrupt. You, you sound a, a bit muffled. Um, uh, Still? Yeah, this is much better. Okay. Yes. I will hold this to my mouth. Yes, so good. the, the idea of is cancer irreversible process, right? So throughout um, history, there's been thoughts of holy water or prayer or a tumor that has spontaneously regressed. And so in the 1960s, they define, it is actually a defined scientific term, which is a partial and complete disappearance of malignant tumor in the absence of treatment or in presence of therapy. A review of literature, um, whatever that it may be, most of his stories, is actually shows this, that it's most closely associated with co-infections. So virtually all reports notes regression that's concomitant with infections, right? So someone with a visually very obvious cancer, let's say breast cancer, or in this case, melanoma, which you can actually see on the skin, they're concurrently um, co-infected with uh, smallpox, syphilis, tuberculosis is a very common uh, situation. And you can actually visibly see these uh, regressions. And that's how we know back in the old days that your immune system plays a huge part in cancer management and in treatment. And this you just saw, uh, Dr. William Cauley. So I'll talk a little bit about him. Uh, if you wiki him, he's actually fascinating, right? So the, so the, the this physician is an orthopedic uh, oncologist back then. This is almost 100 years ago in New York. And he really, I think, exemplified that clinician scientists in, in the very pure sense. So he came, he is, uh, was an orthopedic oncologist during, in the New York area, probably the forerunner of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he was asked to treat a patient who was actually fairly well off, uh, a young lady with osteosarcoma. And despite his best effort, this, this woman died. At the same time in the New York area, he also uh, attends kind of the public universities, uh, so what we were considered uh, indigent care. And there is another, uh, another patient there that has osteosarcoma, multiple infections, and as he was attending for that short period of time, he thought this man is dead for sure. And the story goes that as he was going around New York a few years later, he sees this gentleman and he recognized him as his patient who he thought for sure was a, was a dead man. Whereas his young lady who had all the resources in the world who I believe was a friend of the Rockefellers actually passed away. And when he asked this, this, uh, this surviving 
osteosarcomication, he noted that this guy had multiple skin infections. And this is actually one of the reasons he came out with Collie's toxin, right? So this is the story of an immigrant patient. And so he took a clinical outcome. He made a theory back in the time with before the FDA, before regulatory. And what he did was that he thought that strep has something to do with it. So what he did was he concocted this particular toxin. And once again, back before the time of regulatory and IRB, he went ahead and infected people with this toxin. This would never go now. And he actually dedicated his career to this. And his daughter published this afterwards that he had 210 patients of different type of cancer. And you see response rates that we would, uh, you know, at the time, only really uh, just shockingly good response rates, 100% on multiple myeloma, especially sarcoma, something like 63% lymphoma, and so on. And uh, then it turned out probably not the most ethical situation to be infecting people with toxins, and it kind of went uh, nowhere in that sense. But that principle really is something that has endured for quite some time. And if you look at the different uh, history and different timeline of immunotherapy, you see Collie uh, and Collie right here. You see Steinman with the uh, discovery of the dendritic cells, uh, immune surveillance by Burnett. So it's a number of uh, really world-renowned scientists that has contributed to this idea. But if you look from 1863, really all the way up until I would argue 1976, when you say the first study with BCG with bladder cancer, we know all of this information, but for you as a patient, for us as a clinician, it didn't matter because there's nothing to give you. And in 1976, we got PCG, and it took a good couple of decades before and they went ahead and skipped high dose IL 2. But probably in the 1999s, there was interferon, high dose IL 2 in 2011 with ipilimumab and so on. So it really, what you're seeing on the therapeutic aspect, meaning something to give to you, really builds off nearly 100 years of research for the immune system and its role in oncology care. And I do not even pretend to understand this, but you should know that even though we talk about the immune system and tumor response, it is incredibly complicated, right? And all these little bubbles and diagram, which grows even further, uh, were really, were really indicating this thing. Let me do a quick little time check here. Um, I think we're still okay. So the current incorporation of IO into standard therapy, and no, this is from 2018. And I'll just tell you in the last three years, this has changed even more. But in 2013, this slide would have been one line, right? So that's how much it has changed. So things like lung cancer, where uh, it is really the standard care at this point, renal cell cancer, bladder has gotten increasing new approval, head and neck, melanoma, gastric, Merkel cell, when it's really changed the entire scheme and it's taking it from very difficult cancer to a nearly curable cancer. Uh, the, we actually did an internal survey within oh, no, actually Southern California, actually within the Federation, we looked at throughout entire membership. Uh, this was uh, work that I published with Fagel and a pharmacy resident back in 2017. So this is four years ago. At the time, we had something like 17, uh, well, almost 2,000 patients getting IO therapy. We showed that there's a wide range of age that accepts uh, the therapy. We showed that there is a morbidity, meaning that patients are real life patients, that they have other medical problems and they're still able to accept this and looking at the side effects of this. So we definitely track this within our own system. Um, if you look at treatment adverse events, what well, we have shown that within Southern California, Kaiser, it is equivalent to what we're seeing in clinical research, really making the point that this is not just an ivory tower therapy, but this is something that is effective and useful in the community. One of the very interesting things we, we see with immunotherapy, that there is a new pattern in uh, treatment response, that there is an idea that you not only control the lesion, like in, for the example, for what Dr. Su works on, which is the TVEC, of the lesion that you are injecting, but that if you trigger the immune response, which is a systemic response, you can also get uh, shrinkage, distal to where you're actually responding. I think I actually have some really pretty slides in that. So this is not uh, injectional. This is ipilimumab, which is a CTLA-4 uh, pathway. And when you look, is if you look at the week 12, you would argue that this treatment didn't work, right? Because it looks so much worse than the screening. But if you've ever 
twisted an ankle and had a couple of days of swelling. This is really what that looks like. And so for immunotherapy, if you hang with it, you can see improvement. So the idea of um, the idea that we are looking at a totally different ball game than traditional chemotherapy where we expect shrinkage right away or surgery when hopefully it's all cut out. Immunotherapy is a different piece that we need to learn. Uh, there's a unique kinetics of response. So here is not a dermal response. If you look at the pretreatment, this is a liver for those of you who may not know. So that's kind of the light grayish organ. You get you give the immunotherapy and, and that doesn't look good. I mean, it's everything's kind of popping up. And he went ahead and got no further treatment. And over time, as this patient keeps surviving, you see the response, you see the flare of the response, and you see the dissolution of the response and the return to a normal liver, okay? So um, this is one of the things that has altered when we write clinical trials to not give up on therapy too early. So if you make a call on therapy, whether or not it's effective or not, at the three months mark, you really may be missing quite a bit of treatment. So that is a concept I really want to share that um, the science behind uh, immune therapy really indicate that there could be a flare phenomena and something that uh, your treating physicians should know well. So here's uh, kind of the last section, which is the current area of research, uh, by no means comprehensive, but some of the things that that I'm for sure very interested in in bringing trials within our particular system. So high dose IL-2, that's to the left, uh, what you can see is a, it's 270 patients that are treated in the 1980s and 1993. And how we used to term high dose IL-2 is almost like winning the genetic lotto, okay? So back then, there is no other immune therapy treatment that is effective. You take this 200, uh, some odd patient, 270 patients through. And what you see is that for most of them, it just did not work. But something around 10 to 20%, you had a response where it stabilized. And for an even smaller percentage, some around 5 to 6%, you had complete response. And those people were effectively given back their life. In fact, there are people who still have survived uh, 20, 30, 40 years later. And what you know is that you had mounted effective immune therapy, immune response, and his own immune system or her own immune system has went on to guard against that body. Now, uh, to the right, I'm not sure if you care, the entire thing is a little bit more, uh, more uh, flushed out of the idea that the approval did come based on that very small percentage of response in both melanoma in 1998 and metastatic renal cell in 1992. And really it's that durable, protective, curative response that we see in that seven to, you can tend to a little bit high, frankly, but seven to 10% of the patient. So the clinical trial that we brought is with a drug called Bempeg. And then PEG is newer, better IL-2, the idea of pegylated IL-2, because IL-2 therapy has the issue of being, being given in patient, only being given in a highly intense and well-trained center, whereas pegylated IL-2 can be given uh, in, in an infusion clinic. In fact, we just treated a patient yesterday on this clinical trial. And this is one that is starting to accrual with excellent response rate. And I really uh, encourage you, if this applies to you, to, to ask your uh, particular treating team about it. And so Bempeg is what we call Nectar 214. Nobody pretends to uh, know the entire word. And it's harnessing that IL-2 pathway to increasing tumor infiltrated lymphocytes or otherwise no as tills. So uh, IL-2 being the original drug in the 1980s and 1990s, it took a good 30 years, but we have finally pegulated it, and we're hoping to bring that treatment to the, to the greater um, community. There's new immune strategies with uh, metastatic cancer in terms of checkpoint inhibitors with the CTLA-4 pathways, some of which drugs that you know very well. So ipilimumab, anti-PD-1, of which there are five in the marketplace, pemelizumab, volumab, tezolizumab, derva, and uh, abelumab, nanospartalizumab has also been uh, having some very favorable and exciting clinical trial results. Um, oh, I'm stuck. So for the checkpoint inhibitors, it's specifically talking about the fact that the cancer is quite good at suppressing your immune system from responding, the breaks, if you will, and by removing the breaks, that somehow you can be launching an immune response. So as you can see, there are different areas that you can activate. 
um, overall, you have these response rates. This is specific for melanoma that is much better than what we see with single agent IL-2. And this is, I think, kind of the last five slides. We talk a lot about the cancer immunogram, right? That there are different areas that you can act on cancer, whether or not it's removing of the break, whether or not it's launching of the novel antigen. In this particular case, you see immune cell infil uh, infiltration, which is what the TVEC therapy that Dr. Um, uh, uh, Sherry was talking about, it's at the kind of the four o'clock mark, the intratumoral T cells. You talk about a general immune response. So if you go to the two o'clock mark, we have agents such as uh, IL-7, IL-2 to increase lymphocyte count, the whole idea of uh, tumor foreignness, the novel mutational burden, uh, that is something that is heavily sought after also. And how sensitive is that tumor to that immune effector? Um, why are some cancers immune cold versus other cancers? that you know warm. So all of this forms a very complicated dial of potential areas that we can intervene. And uh, here you see it gets even more complicated, right? So specifically now here we're looking at T cell. How do we enhance those attacks? Do we block the inhibitors? Do we turn up the activators? How does that work? And, uh, you know, different things that we can look at. So this particular drug is not even a melanoma cell. Uh, Superlucil T is the first vaccination against cancer, in this case, prostate cancer. It is uh, the idea that you would take your uh, prostate cancer, culture it in the right medium, and create a dendritic vaccine. And I know that that effort to further expand beyond the prostate cancer world is ongoing. And... Um, Here's a couple of different points. As this is a melanoma talk, you can just do this quickly, um, but it definitely has its pitfalls, but very promising technology on top of that. And finally, this actually, I won't belabor, this is, uh, this is Sherry's bread and butter with TVEC. Uh, this was the trial that got to its approval as a single agent and we are awaiting, and I know we completed, uh, was part of the trial with combination, and we're waiting the result for that fairly eagerly. I'm hoping the next year or two. And let me kind of sum through this. And here you see beautiful pictures. This is actually Honda's uh, from SMR, but you, uh, the Dr. Sue had some a real life Riverside uh, responses. And the final thing that I want to talk about is actually CAR-T therapy, adoptive T-cell therapy, because it's all the rage, right? And the approvals are coming in TIL therapy. And this in that idea is much more personalized. How do we take a patient whose cancer, whose immune system is coexisting together and turn a novel engineer a T-cell that could be personalized and attacking it? Um, this work is already being done um, in Southern California. The City of Hope Cedars are huge sites for this. And how do we activate it and creating more access for patients as more and more needs um, come through? So this is exciting time in cancer immune therapy research. Kind of babbled on probably for a little bit longer than I'm supposed to, but I'll stop here and really turn the mic back uh, to Sherry and uh, Sam and uh, go from there. Thank you, Dr. Moon, for this very informative talk. Thank you for joining us this Saturday.